Middle school students, how are we feeling? Good. Man, I'm excited to be with all of you tonight as we are entering into the second week of our series, Serve Season. Last week, we got to hear um, an incredible story from Katiana. Um, she was a woman who, as a kid, she received a shoebox, and when she received that shoebox, her whole life changed. In that shoebox, she got to hear the gospel, she got to know Jesus as her Savior, and it changed her eternity. And next week, we're going to give you guys an opportunity to pack shoeboxes here, so you have the opportunity to do the same thing. You're going to have an option. Hopefully, all of your small groups dropped off all of your items you've been shopping for in the hallway um, tonight. And so next week, we're going to take all of those toys that you guys have purchased. We're going to package them. We're going to pray over them. We're going to write letters to these students that will be receiving these boxes with the hope that when they get to where they're going, that students get to not just know that they're loved and they're seen and they're um, cared for by us, but more importantly, that they're loved and they're seen and they're cared for by Jesus. These students, that, these kids that receive these boxes are going to get an opportunity to hear the gospel and receive it. And so even though we're going to do such a small act of service, it's, it has the possibility of having such a big impact. But before we get to packaging those shoe boxes next week, it's important for us this week to take some time to understand and really dig into why service and why serving other people is so important and so important specifically for Christians. The reality is that plenty of people do, who don't know Jesus, they still serve. They still serve. Plenty of people who don't know Jesus volunteer their time and their energy and they serve in their communities. Like when natural disasters happen, you'll see plenty of people that will, they'll go and they'll volunteer their time and their money for people who are affected. The point is that you don't have to love Jesus to serve. You don't. However, acts of service apart from Jesus are often empty. They're often self-serving. I think about the celebrities that jump onto Instagram when a natural disaster happens and, and all of a sudden they start acting like they, they care a ton. And maybe they do care, but the reality is that they also get really good publicity for caring on Instagram, right? Or you might think about some of the people that will volunteer for different organizations. Maybe people who don't know Jesus who volunteer for organizations really care about the organizations that they are volunteering for, but they probably also have something else that they're aiming for, right? Like I remember when I was a student, I was volunteering in all kinds of organizations because I kind of cared, but mostly because I knew I needed to get volunteer hours to look good on a resume, to get into that school, to look good in front of my peers. And still other people volunteer because they feel like they have some kind of like obligation to do that so they can get into heaven or they feel like they can work their way to a better afterlife. There's so many ways that a person that doesn't necessarily know or love Jesus can still do good acts of service. But something I'm confident about is that those people are always going to do acts of service so that they can also get something out of it for them. Because that's just our human nature. Also, as a non-believer, service is, is kind of optional. You don't have, if you don't know Jesus, you don't really have to serve. You're not obligated to do it. And you could still be like a cool, successful person, even if you don't volunteer as a non-believer. But here's the point of all of this. That is not the case for Christians. That is not the case for people who claim to know and to walk with Jesus. The life of a Christian is a life that is to be marked by service. It's a non-negotiable for the Bible. This service should be motivated and modeled after Jesus himself. And when we serve in this way, we have a service that can make an eternal impact, an eternal impact for the kingdom. It can impact others and it can actually cause deep peace and joy to happen within our lives. And so tonight, as we talk about service, I wanna show you specifically three things that our service should be motivated and modeled by if we are to have service that glorifies God, if we are to have service that has an eternal impact. So three things, point one being this, serving starts with understanding grace. It always starts with truly understanding grace. We see in 1 Peter 4.10, it says this, it says, just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. What does that mean? Okay, so 1 Peter tells us that we should serve others because we're stewards of God's grace. 
That word steward is probably interesting for some of us. Some of us maybe don't know what that means. So here's what steward means. To steward or to be a steward is someone who is responsible for looking after something that is given to them. And in this passage, we see that we are to be faithful stewards, good stewards of God's grace. But let me give you an example of what it looks like maybe to steward first. Okay, so for example, maybe I have a friend that gives me a really cool sweatshirt. They're letting me borrow one of like the coolest sweatshirts that they own. When I have that sweatshirt, I would be stewarding that sweatshirt. It's not my sweatshirt. I didn't pay for it. I don't own it. It's not really mine. It was given to me to look after, to steward for a specific amount of time. And to steward that sweatshirt well, what I would do is I would make sure that I'm not getting stains on it, I'm not getting it dirty, I'm keeping track of where it is. If something does happen to it, I'm putting it in the washing machine, I'm making sure it gets folded up really nice, I'm stewarding it faithfully, I'm stewarding it well. But I could also steward that sweatshirt really poorly. I could not care about what happens to it, I could drop all kinds of stuff on it, get it all stained, not throw it in the washer, throw it in a pile on the floor. I'm still stewarding it, I'm just not stewarding it well. I'm being a bad steward of the sweatshirt. Peter tells us in this passage that we need to be good and faithful stewards of not a sweatshirt, but of the grace of God. And so many of us don't even, we don't fully even understand that grace. And if you're in this space tonight and you don't know who Jesus is, it's because you don't understand grace. Because if you understood his grace, you would submit to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, because his grace is like nothing else that this world has to offer. And Ephesians 2 um, explains the grace of Jesus so well. Starting in verse one, Ephesians says this. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. So the first part of this passage says, hey, before you understood grace, before you received the gift of grace, before you understood who Jesus was, this was you, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were a slave to to your flesh and the ways of the world. But then something incredible happens. But then God but God who is rich in his mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. Listen to this part. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is, a, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. This grace that we've been given, we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, there's nothing that we can do on this side of the cross to continue to earn it or pay it back. Jesus has simply saved us out of the love that he had for us, as a free gift to us. This is, this is grace, this is an undeserved gift. And when we really understand that truth, when we really understand the gospel, when we let it sink into our hearts and our minds, we start to let it change the way that we live and the way that we think and the way that we care for those around us and the way that we serve. So when 1 Peter tells us that we are to be faithful stewards of God's grace by serving others, this is what he's not saying, students. He's not saying that we are to serve so that we can earn grace. We are to serve others because we understand we've already been given much grace. We've already received it. We don't serve to earn grace. We serve because of grace. This is something so important for us to understand. And I've heard so many stories, especially over the past couple of weeks, where so many of you don't, you don't understand this. You really struggle with this. There's still such a big part of you that really wants to earn this grace. You want to earn your salvation. You want to serve more. You want to work harder. You want to be a little less sinless before you start accepting grace. But that's just not how grace works. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's not about what you can offer. It's all about Jesus and what he can offer. And when we understand that, we serve others because we understand that Jesus first served us. 
As 1 John uh, 4, 19 says, it says that we love because he first loved us. When we understand that we are able to model the same kind of service, the same kind of love to those around us, but you can never do it until you understand grace. So that is our first step. But point two is this, that serving means sacrifice. So once we accept grace and we start living our lives from a place of understanding grace, then as we go to serve, we understand that serving will demand sacrifice from us. What does sacrifice mean? Sacrifice is defined as this. It's to give up something that is valuable to you in order to help another person. That's true sacrifice. So so true service will always come at a cost to you. If you think that you're serving someone but it didn't cost you anything valuable, it probably wasn't service. It was just something that you were probably gonna do anyways. So what might service cost you? Well, it might cost you your time. It might cost you your energy, your comfort, your convenience, resources, stuff, sleep. Some of us are so unwilling to serve because we just don't even wanna lose sleep, right? I've been there before. The reality, this reality makes it so hard for us sometimes to serve though. Because when we understand that we have to sacrifice something to serve other people, we just don't like to sacrifice anything so we just don't serve, right? We don't like giving up our stuff. We don't like giving up our comfort. But as Christians, that's our call. As Christians, we understand that Jesus doesn't ask us to do something that he hasn't already done. Jesus is the perfect model for what it looks like to sacrificially serve. We see in Mark 10, starting in verse 43, Jesus says this, he says, on the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man, even Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is God. Jesus created everything. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of all of our stuff. And yet, even when we were sinning against him, even when we were enemies of God, as it says in Romans 5.10, Jesus still came. And he came not to be served, even though he deserved it. But he came instead to serve. He sacrificed everything. He sacrificed the comfort of his heavenly throne. He, he sacrificed earthly comforts and desires and relationships. He often went to bed not knowing where he was going to sleep or having a place to lay his head. He was constantly exhausted from his ministering to people and the healing of the sick and, and, and working all kinds of miracles to care and for, to serve those that were around him. And he went so far as to even sacrifice himself. He sacrificed himself physically to pay the price for our sins. If Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega, came not to be served but to serve, then we should look to him as our example. And when we do that, we not only steward God's grace faithfully, but we also pursue the kind of greatness that he's called us to as Christians, greatness that is lasting for God's kingdom, It's eternal. But there's a final thing that we have to understand about service, about serving, is that we have to serve with the right motives. Serving with the right motives matters. I remember growing up um, at my dad's house, we had one bathroom, we had more than one bathroom, but there was only one bathroom that we were allowed to use. It was designated kids' bathroom. And it was me and my brother and my two sisters that had to use that bathroom as we were getting ready um, in the morning before school. And I happened to fall third in line. So my two other sisters got to go first and second, and then I was third in line to use the bathroom. And here's the thing about my sisters, is that they are uh, pretty messy people, more or less. So they're really messy people. And so I would get into the bathroom, a third in line in the morning, and by the time that I got into the bathroom, Here's what it would look like. There would be toothpaste in the sink. There'd be stuff all over the counter. There'd be stuff splattered on the mirror. There would be like globs, girls understand this, or if you have sisters, you understand this, just globs of hair in the shower. Y'all know what that looks like, right? Gross, okay? It was a war zone in there. And so I would go in there every single morning and this is what I would do. I would wipe down the counters. 
I'd put all the stuff away. I'd wipe down the mirror. I'd clean the toothpaste out of the sink. I would take a piece of toilet paper, gag a little bit, wipe the hair out of the, out of the shower, throw it in the trash, okay? I would do all of that. And from the outside, it looked like I was being a really good servant. I was cleaning up a mess that wasn't mine. And I didn't ask for anything in return. I never used it as leverage to get anything from my dad and my stepmom. I never lorded it over my sister's heads that I was doing that. So even though it looked though like I was serving from the outside, really what my motive was was not good. On the inside, I was cleaning that bathroom every single morning out of frustration. I was cleaning it out of bitterness. I cleaned it to meet my standards and my preferences. I cleaned it to prove to some extent that I was better than my sisters. They, they don't have their act together. I got my act together. I can clean my hair out of my own shower. I wanted to prove something to myself. None of my motives were right. My motives were not right. And because of that, I never cleaned that bathroom joyfully. I never cleaned that bathroom and got any kind of peace out of it. I never cleaned that bathroom in order to honor my sisters, to honor my parents. It was a selfish service. And truthfully, I think a lot of us find that we serve selfishly. But selfish service won't get you anywhere. It won't get you the peace that you think it will get you. It won't get you um, the joy that you think that serving others should get you. Your motives have to be right. And when your motives are right, you have the ability to actually bless the people around you. You have the ability to actually glorify the God the way that we should. You actually have the ability to get joy in the process yourself. And so we have to ask the question, what are the right motives? As a Christian, what are the right motives for serving? Two things. First motive is this, that we are to serve and glorify God. That should be our first motive. Colossians 3.23 says this. It says, whatever you do, do it from the heart. Do it with the right motive, as something done for the Lord and not for people. Knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. So first and foremost, as Christians, everything we do, every single thing we do should be about serving and glorifying God. So in the Bible, when he, when he calls us to take care of the weak, when he calls us to take care of the poor and the sick and the orphaned and the lonely, it's not to make us look good. It's not to make us feel good. It's not so that we can earn grace, but rather it's a way that we show the world around us the goodness of God, the character of God, the love of God. It's the way that we glorify God. Our service is not about glorifying us. It's only about glorifying God. That's our first motive. But to do that well, we have to do it in humility. And this is where our second motive comes in. We should have a motive to serve others like Jesus did. He is the perfect example of what it looks like to serve in humility. Philippians 2 paints this beautiful picture of, of what it looks like for us to serve the way that Jesus served what it looks like to live humbly the way that Jesus did. Here's the example, Philippians 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Other translations say don't do anything with grumbling. That's tough for a lot of us. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. And, and what's our model for this? Who do we look to? Verse five says, we are to adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, once again, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Even at the end of this passage, so we see that Jesus is this perfect example of humility. Being God himself, he still humbled himself to become a servant for us, even though we were so undeserving of it. 
And then we see because of his perfect humility and his perfect servants, service and his perfect obedience to glorify the Father, we see that that, that was always Jesus' goal, is just to, just to glorify the Father. I'm gonna serve others, I'm gonna do it in humility to glorify the Father. When we serve with right motives, we also see in this passage, God blesses service when it's done with the right motives motives. God blesses our obedience when it's done with the right motives. But I don't want you guys to get confused. Remember what we just talked about with grace. We are not to be people that serve God and try to glorify him so we can get stuff from him. We are not to try to do things that we can get stuff from God. We serve because we understand grace. We serve because we understand that Jesus has come and he's given everything for us. And out of that understanding, we just now have a desire to be obedient to God. We now have a desire to serve and care for those around us. We now have a desire to glorify him with everything that we do and that we say. But the beautiful thing is that when we serve rightly, God blesses our faithfulness. God blesses our obedience. And I can tell you from experience that when you serve others with the right motives, you will receive a fullness and a joy and a peace unlike anything that you've ever experienced before. You will experience a nearness to God. You will see God move in ways that you never expected. And you will have so many stories of his faithfulness as you serve him rightly. If you claim to be Christian, you are a servant. That is your call. But serving rightly can be really difficult to learn, especially in the world that we live in today, especially as a middle schooler. So as you head to small group after worship tonight, I wanna leave you with some questions to help you identify maybe where you're getting stuck in your service, where you're getting stuck in these mentalities that are, are maybe not helping you to serve rightly. So I start off by saying that the first thing that we need to understand is that serving starts with understanding grace. My question to you students are, do you serve to try to earn grace? Do you serve others to try to earn grace? I know that so many of you are struggling with this. So this is where we need to to rest tonight in our small groups. This is what we need to dive into. What does it look like to actually understand grace? What does it look like to, to accept it? What does it look like to live lives fueled by grace? I would just encourage you guys to spend time in small group actually dissecting that. I said for point two that serving means sacrifice. For some of us, we understand grace, but when it comes to sacrifice, that's tough for us. Because there are things in our life that we just aren't willing to sacrifice yet. What are those things that you're not willing to sacrifice? Is it your sleep? Is it your comfort? Is it your schedule? What is it that you're not willing to sacrifice to serve rightly? And then finally, serving with the right motive matters. Students, what are your motives for serving? Is it so that you can look good? Is it that you can get a resume builder? Is it that you can get hours at a, at a volunteer place that you need to get for some other extracurricular activity? What, like, what are your motives? Because if the motive isn't, I want to glorify God. If the motive isn't, I know that Jesus has come and he's loved me and served me well, so I want to love and serve others well, then our motives are wrong. What are your motives? I encourage you guys to actually talk through these things in small group tonight. I think if we become a people that learn how to serve rightly, to glorify God rightly, then we're gonna make big moves for the kingdom. I believe that, and I believe that you guys can do that as middle schoolers. You don't have to wait until you're older. You don't have to wait until you have it all together. You can start serving the kingdom now. Let's pray to that end. God, we thank you for tonight, just another opportunity to be with all of these students, to learn from your word. God, I pray that as we talk about service, that, that, that the idea of serving rightly would just take root in our hearts and our minds and that for those of us who struggle with serving well because we don't understand grace yet or, or because we're not willing to sacrifice, God, I pray whatever roadblocks are up in our hearts and our minds that you would tear those down, that you would help us to identify them and that, God, you would purify our hearts so that glorifying you becomes our number one goal and purpose. 
God, for the students in this room that I was just talking that whole time and they (laughs) did not care at all and they could care less about Jesus. God, I pray that even tonight in small group or, or even through the worship tonight, Lord, that there would be something about your glory and about your love and about your majesty that would catch their eyes' attention, that would catch their heart's attention, Lord. That this would not just be another night that they walk into this space and goof off with their friends and leave still lost, still broken, still empty, but this could be a night where they start to understand how deeply they are loved and cared for. They would start to understand that there is a God of the universe that cares for them, a holy God that they have sinned against, that has sent his son to offer them forgiveness. God, I pray that you would bring salvation in this room tonight, and for those of us who do know your son, God, just continue to empower us to serve you well. God, we love you, and we pray this all in your holy name. Amen.